What do you think of when you hear Simina? Do you think of movies like Blade Runner, Citizen Kane, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, The SpongeBob movie? No. Joe. I think of Joe Cinema. Now his name isn't Joe Cinema, it's Joe Simonera. So let's buckle down and beef up while I introduce you to Joe and his wonderful Simina. I discovered Joe through Tubi, or more specifically, a game I play with friends called the Tubi Wheel. Created by my friend Dak, this is basically a movie night battle royale where you all pick movies on Tubi and eliminate them until only one remains. I've asked my friend Dak to relay the rules to you, so without further ado, here is my friend Dak to tell you the rules of Tubi Wheel if you would like to play it yourself. Hi, I'm Dak. I'm Brendan's friend. Rule number one. Movies are added and then removed from the wheel until only one remains. Number two, thou shalt always commit to the wheel if you commit to the wheel. If someone adds a movie, then they must participate and watch. No cowards. Number three, the wheel knows and is omnipotent. If you try to spurn the wheel, the wheel will spurn you. I will not explain further. Number four, movies must be at least one hour long no television shows. Number five, while spinning the wheel, you must listen to Armored Core for answer, remember OST extended. This is the wheel song. Number six, you must pick one wheel master who has a slight sway over the wheel in ethereal and mysterious ways. I will not explain further. Number seven, you can add any rules to this to change it however you see fit. Just remember that the wheel will know what you do. Thanks, Dak, for the wheel knowledge. And now, back to the rest of the video. I've watched a lot of movies I wouldn't otherwise enjoy, or movies that I knew I would hate and then ended up hating. And I've sat through the unofficial Fortnite skit because of the wheel. That was a dark day in wheel history. But we're not here to talk directly about Tubi Wheel, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. We're talking about Joe. In a 73 movie battle royale that included movies like Dark City, uh, Little Man, and Big Stan, one movie won. The Wizard's Books, A Tale of Three Sisters, directed, written, and starring Joe Simonera. This movie is something. It's an hour and a half long, and children are trying to stop a primordial evil Dark Lord using magic wands, and also there is a school, and also there is a dragon. That's probably the best way to explain it other than Harry Potter on fentanyl. Now, I've seen Harry Potter rip-off movies before. The Mystical Adventures of Billy Owens used to be one I recommended to people, mostly because it has Rowdy Roddy Piper in it, and anything that has a wrestler in it is always in my watch list. The Wizard's Books is worse, but better, but also worse. Not worse parentheses negative, though more worse parentheses positive. Does that make any sense to you? This is a movie wherein 40 to 60% of it is stock footage. The moments that aren't stock footage are people speaking in front of stock footage and green screened in. In fact, there is so little of this movie that takes place outside of a green screen set that it begins to get a little ridiculous. An example of this is earlier in the movie where we're in a little girl's bedroom and then later when the bedroom is green screen stock footage when previously it was an actual bedroom and then later again, it's it's a different bedroom, and there's no consistency. It's like watching Harry Potter through the eyes of a madman, and it's glorious for it. Also, I didn't even talk about the fruit chair. There's this fruit chair, and I fixated on this fruit chair, because aside from the girl and the evil witch lady whose name I don't remember and refuse to remember, there's this fruit chair that appears in the movie sporadically, and I think, God, that fruit chair, it's real! It's my foundation! And it was. Somehow this fruit chair kept me going through this movie, and it made the experience even better. Whenever the fruit chair wasn't on screen, I was constantly asking myself, where's the fruit chair? 
Also, Dobby is in this, the, the little house elf from Her Harold Potter. And I just, I, I can't explain to you more than Dobby is there. And now you remember Dobby and he wears a potato sack and his name is a teeny. And I think it's a teeny because he's a teeny guy. And that's just so fucking funny. It's so fucking funny, Joe. It's goddamn brilliant. Uh, but now you, 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 you've gotten Dobby. You, you got Dobby. I'm sorry. Here's an image of Gucci Dobby. Do you remember Gucci Dobby? I remember Gucci Dobby. Dobby cinema indulgence. This movie is best explained through fragmented visions of it. There's a plot, but it doesn't matter. There's kids getting magic wands, and then stuff happens, a kid dies, and they magically go to the magic school, and it sets up for a sequel. There you go, you understand the plot of the wizard books. But I can't mention the wizard books and talk about it without talking about the child death scene. I have to talk about the child death scene. I can't talk about this movie the way that a normal person would talk about a movie. I have to talk about this movie in the way that Joe Simonera would direct me talking about this movie. Do you understand where Joe has taken me? There's a child death scene in this and it's one of the kids who dies. There's also a child memory wipe scene. I, I, don't, I don't know why the kid just didn't want to be a part of the fun wizard group, but the child death scene is really important. The kid dies to my favorite actor in this movie and the entirety of the wizard books. He, he dies to the guy who is trying his hardest to act in this entire movie. He is such a joy to see on screen every single time I see him. I'm nuts. You want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. And he reminds me of me when I was a theater kid, and that's probably why I enjoyed him so much. I hooked directly onto this guy, and I, I put myself in his place, and I thought, you know what? He's having fun. Everybody on this set is having a good time and having fun, and that's really what Joe Semina is all about. It's not about if the movie is good. It's not about if the movie even makes sense. It's not about the, the dirt woman, woman of the dirt. I seek the lady of the dirt. Answer my calling. It's about fun. It's just a fun movie. This is a movie that is best experienced with friends at 3 a.m. at the peak of burnout. And I don't want to spoil any more of the wizard books for you. I don't want to spoil too much of the experience for you. Watch this movie, preferably with friends. I wouldn't wish you to wizard alone, but you'll enjoy so many perfect moments of absolute slop it is something to behold. Now, we talked about the Wizards books. I really, really wanted to just focus on some small parts of the Joe Cinemaverse. Uh, really, I, I wanted to focus on Joe and the movie Somnium. So, now that we've prepped you with a small cup of Joe, who is Joseph Simonera? What is he cooking? Well, he was in fact cooking before he became the genius writer, director, producer, and actor that he is now. Joe Simonera was a cook on a public broadcasting show called Taste This TV, and to his word, he is a world-renowned chef in the world of chefery. If there is the bear, Joe Cinema is the grizzly. He also had a rave review in the New York Times in which they called his cooking the peak of cinematography, and he still cooks to this day. Now, we're learning about Joe, we're processing Joe, but most importantly, we need to hear this from Joe's own mouth. Here's an excerpt from JoeSeminaraCooking.com. Chef Joe Simonera is considered one of the most creative chefs in America. He was named a top 10 creative chefs by Gourmet Magazine in 2007. His has hosted a number of primetime TV cooking shows and is considered a pioneer having launched the biggest food production film company in the nation. Chef offers his incredible world-renowned experience as a private tasting for people who take food seriously. The menu, which changes daily, commits itself to serving classic French cuisine with the finest quality ingredients, along with a Similarly intense focus on impeccable guest service. You can actually hire Joe via his website and have him cater an event for you. And you can bet your sweet bippy that the money goes right back into funding his filmmaking habit. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Another fun fact about Joe, Joe has an uncredited, not listed in the credits, but listed in IMDb role in The Irishman. He's listed as a butcher. So, you know, a man like Joe is a learned scholar of the arts. To work with De Niro, you have to be one of the best, baby. But I'm not going to go 
everyone watch The Irishman so I can get one frame of Joe. Um, I think he also helped out with some catering after the movie, but it's really just that he was in The, the Irishman. I discovered Joe through the Wizards books, but I really wanted to take a look, a closer look at his movie Somnium, a movie that can only be described as the grandpa torture nexus. Somnium is about two girls who have supernatural powers and they utilize those powers to torture some home invaders who kill their grandfather. There's a twist though, and it's not that this movie was made, people are in it, and that it's just on YouTube and Tubi for you to watch. I have yet to go through all the Simina archives, but I will say so far that Somnium has been the most interesting of the movies that I have seen. It's shot on a set, it doesn't try to use too many effects, and it has this guy in it. I love this old man, Robert Aronson. He's in so much of the Joe Cinemaverse, and he's genuinely a treasure. Actually, the more I look into the IMDb for Joe and his reoccurring cast, I realize that so many of them were also all cast in uncredited roles in The Irishman. How many butchers are there in The Irishman? Did De Niro need that many butchers? I think the movie is about meat. There's meat in the movie. I googled it. I googled The Irishman. There is meat in the movie. The other side of Joe's cast is family members. Uh, Joe loves to hire family, and I love that he does so. But Robert, we're talking about Robert Aronson. Robert stuck out to me in an episode of Joe's Twilight Zone series, Tales from the Dark. Three episodes of this are available on Tubi, but the rest can be found on one of Joe's many YouTube channels. In this, Robert plays a racist father who gets his comeuppance by being sucked into his television so that his daughter Kathleen can move on with her life without him. He loves the factory, he hates tiny hats, and he says gay marriage twice. Gay marriage? Gay marriage? Joe also appears at the end of this episode while Robert has television-induced psychosis racism, and Joe really, really likes to do a British accent in his media sometimes. For almost no reason, Joe will just randomly bust out this British accent when he appears and just throw it towards you. You gotta go in there and work every day, mate. What about me? Get in here. What about, what about you? Sean. Joe appears in both this and at the end of Somnium doing his silly British accent, but since he plays a pivotal role in the Wizard books, there is no bad British accent to be found. Robert is also in the Wizard books, but just as a background character. In Somnium, however, he's the grandpa. You gotta love grandpa. Somnium, like I said, is about two little girls who have magic, supernatural powers. Their grandpa, played by Robert, takes care of them and drugs them, but only sometimes to stop them from using their supernatural powers. The powers are kind of dreamwalking, I, I guess. It's, it's not really clear. They're sleep related. They're supernatural. They're magical. It's scary. They just gave Joe the chalk and he started riding sigils onto the sidewalk, trying to summon some kind of demon. And he did it. He summoned the demon. This movie is my demon. I refuse to learn the names of the characters in this movie, so I'll just be using descriptors because I already have such an incredibly smooth brain that I don't really need it to be any smoother by learning more of Somnium than I already have from watching it twice. For the first 15 or 20 minutes of the movie, we get a lot of incoherent babbling about the girls. Two people arrive, one of them played by the woman who was Kathleen in the Tales from the Dark short, and the other one is some kind of babysitter. Maybe in all of Joe's movies, there's this stench of, this is this person. Maybe this person is this person. Maybe, like nobody is confident enough in the Joe Cinemera verse to actually have like a set role or character. Everything feels so anxious or anxiety driven that it makes the movies excel even further beyond where they should be for me maybe not for you maybe you'll watch this movie and then think brendan this is this is utter tribe this is crap but it is for me an advanced level of crap for me this is exalted crap this is crap that has ascended beyond the planar form crap that has left the septic tank and now it's flying through the sky a beautiful shit comment the somnium siblings who are played by joe's i think kids i don't know once again i think they're played by joe's kids maybe his nieces, their family, and that's all you really need to know. They make the babysitter 
maybe babysitter. See the future where her daughter calls her. That's that's really it. That's where we get like one of the first inklings of them having a power, um, aside from like some creepy shots of them being like creepy twins. Um, she has a dream where her daughter calls her about some test results. You remember that lump in my stomach that we thought might have been cancerous? It turns out that I'm pregnant. Oh, that's so wonderful. Mom, can you believe that? You're going to be a grandma. What? A grandmother? That's wonderful. I'm so excited. That's... I... They, 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 they just make her have a future dream. Um, that's, that's, that's that bit. Um, I don't know. I can't remember if we ever see that character again. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think we do. The, the Kathleen character also is just kind of there and then talking to the grandpa and then she just leaves. I think she's some related family member, but they don't really go any deeper into that. The real meat of Somnium is when three dudes break in. They kill the grandpa and then they just run around the house for a majority of the runtime while being psychically attacked by two little girls. They're really just there to provide the, this is home alone, but instead of setting up devious traps, Kevin McAllister kills you with his mind or tortures you with his mind until you are tortured by the mind prison that they have locked you in, maybe? There are a lot of layers to the mind prison verse. They keep flipping in and out between reality and unreality to the point where you don't know what's going on, which makes the twist even better. The girls also can make people really sleepy. I wanted to mention that because they just do it. They just make people fall asleep or they don't. They also get their medicine, but then they don't. It's such a, it's such a beautiful mess. It really is. It's like a Jackson Pollock painting, but instead of paint, it's blood and viscera and guts, even though the movie doesn't have it. I like to imagine Gigas from Earthbound creating this movie, an ascended man creating an ascended art form. I only have good things to say about Joe, but let's talk about the goons, all right? We have goon one, goon two, and goon three. And don't giggle at me. I'm taking the word goon back to mean henchman for all of us. Goon one sees visions of mother and church and mother and church. Mother is scary. She's covered in blood. She's yelling mother things. Goon one is obviously tormented by mother. Goon two sees scary demon lady from the beginning of the movie. Did I mention that this movie starts with a flashback? I don't think I did mention that this movie starts with a flash forward that you think is a flashback. It's, um, it's an artistic choice that really confused the hell out of me. And looking back further on it, it still confuses the hell out of me. Goon 2 mostly just sees the demon lady. He gets his hand exploded and there are a couple of like bits where there are a lot of people haunting him. Goon 3 is tortured by father. So Goon 1 is mother, Goon 3 is father. And these guys are all maybe mafia guys and they're in the house to steal things for mafia crimes, maybe. It, it, he's the, the worst mafia guy. Actually, they're all the worst mafia guys. This is uh, uh, just a big Benny Hill bit. The entirety of the movie where they just run around and then thing happen and then run around and thing happen and they're all just being psychically attacked. They break into the house. They kill grandpa for no reason. And then it's just 40 to 60 minutes of supernatural hijinks. There's the church scene, the ballroom scene, there's a casino scene. I'm just describing the movie as Joe wrote it. There is a scene and then some things happen. Why do I, why do I love this movie though? Like over the wizard books, why did I want to talk about this one more? Why would I recommend you into the deepest, darkest depths of Joe's mind? The ending. The ending pays it all off in a way that would make Scorsese weep. This entire movie, the entirety of this movie, has a twist, and the twist is that it is all a dream. Not just a dream, but a torture dream dwelled up by the little girls for their grandpa. The grandpa that dies early into the movie, and then we get like 40 minutes of the goons running around. The entirety of the movie exists to torture the grandpa. They're just torturing their poor wheelchair-bound grandpa by making him see goons that kill him. And then they run around 
and uh, things happen to the goons who don't exist. That's their real supernatural power. Mediocre, worse than mediocre, sloppy writing is their supernatural power. And the fact that they torture the grandpa. The grandpa torture nexus pays off. All they do is torture the grandpa. The little girls exist to torment the grandpa. I love Somnium, the grandpa torture nexus, and I love it in a way that I would love a cool rock that I found outside. It is something that I want to put on my shelf and look at and admire and think about and maybe have a nightmare or two about. It's going to live rent free in my head. It's just a perfect sloppy horror movie where things just happen and sometimes there's this iota of more that you feel like is about to jump towards you and the movie is going to explain itself in a wonderful way and you're going to fucking get it. But no, you don't get it. Things continue to just happen and you want to know more. I want to know more. I want to experience unblemished Simina in its most distilled form. I want Joe to keep creating forever because there's something that I genuinely admire about the way that he does create. It's like taking a hammer to a tin can and then looking down and the tin can has morphed and evolved into the statue of David. It's pure, untouched schlock. Thank you, Joe Seminera. Thank you for cooking and thank you for the things you do. I can't wait to experience more of your movies and at some point I will watch all of your filmography. Thank you so much for what you do, Joe. And hey, keep on making great cinema. Thank you for watching. Please check out my other videos. There are also things and hey, dad's home for now. Uh, I have been kind of on and off this year. A lot of things have happened. I, I don't want to go too much into it, but things have been kind of on and off for me. They've been good. They've been bad, but uh, I've been having a blast streaming over at twitch.tv slash Daniel. So if you want to stop in and say, hey, uh, I'll more than likely be there. I'll try to keep up with videos again. I want to get back into creating and making things for you. Uh, so we'll see, I guess, where that goes. And if you like this video, check out my other stuff. It's I got, I got videos that you can watch that'll make you go, what? Wow, that was a video I watched on YouTube, so bye.